much do you want to walk around? I do want to walk around. So give me a second. It's not 11.30 yet anyway. Hey. All right. Good. Uh, can you hear me? Is this... about uh, attempts to construct uh, better graded encoding schemes. Uh, so Mark told us um, some of the reasons why these graded encoding schemes um, are problematic, uh, which is uh, pretty well known yet. So we hope. All right. Good. And that concludes our talk for today. <coughs> um, so I want to tell you about uh, attempts to try to construct better graded encoding schemes and how it didn't work. Um, so the reason is that uh, uh, sometimes these things happen uh, so quickly that uh, the, the actual, the actual you know, attempt, the actual construction was not published uh, before it was broken. And perhaps we're missing out on, on good ideas that can be perhaps improved and used elsewhere. Um, so this is based on discussions and uh, as I write on the slide, joint frustration um, time and time again uh, with um, my student Daniel Benarosh and with uh, Craig Gentry, Shaya Levy, Tanker Lepua, Amit Sahai, Mehdi Tibushi, and um, um, others. Um, let's start with talking about these great encoding schemes. Uh, so the motivating example would be, and something that we sh may perhaps will keep in mind as an analogy, uh, is this uh, problem of non-interactive key exchange. I'm going to go over it very quickly because we all know what we're talking about. So Alice and Bob want to um, create a joint key and uh, the channel between them is eavesdropped. Uh, so what do they do? They decide on a group G um, of order P, let's say P is prime, and there's gonna be a generator G. And each of them is going to sample a random element uh, modulo P, and Alice is going to send G to the A1 uh, over this channel, and Bob sends G to the A2 over the channel. Actually, you can think about it even as a bulletin board, it's non-interactive. And given these values, Bob can sort of compute uh, G to the A1 times uh, A2, and Alice can also take G to the A2 and raise to the power of A1, and both of them can uh, compute G to the A1 times A2, but um, um, hopefully the eavesdropper that sees G to the A1 and G to the A2 cannot come up with uh, G to the A1, A2. So in the exponent, you should be able to compute linear functions, but in order to uh, argue security for this thing, uh, you should not be able to compute quadratics and perhaps not even be able to distinguish them uh, from, from uniform. So this is what allows uh, you to do non-interactive key exchange uh, for two parties. And then what happens if you want more than two parties? Uh, you'd want an additional player to post this G to the A3. Uh, what you'd need for that, um, as uh, um, was, uh, was noticed by Zhu, is that if you have a bilinear map uh, over your group G, then you can uh, extend this functionality to three players. So what is a bilinear map? It's a function that takes two uh, operands from G and outputs an element from a different group GT. Let's uh, also assume that GT is also a group of the same order uh, P. And the property of this function is that it's bilinear in the exponent. So if I apply it to G to the X and G to the Y, then what I get is the same thing as if I applied it to just the generator and raised the result to the power XY. So um, if we have access to a group that, is, uh, that, that also has this additional functionality, then uh, say Alice can apply the bilinear map on G to the A2 and G to the A3, get EGG to the power A2, A3, raise that to the power um, of, of A1, and get this uh, value EGG to the power A1, A2, A3. Um, so uh, it is possible to compute, uh, quadra uh, compute quadratic function but cubic functions should, should still be hard. So um, the eavesdropper that sees all these values should not be able to compute EGG to the power A1, A2, A3. And this would give you um, non-interactive key exchange for three players. What about for more players? So um, uh, Bonet and Silverberg said, wouldn't it be nice if we had some sort of generalization of this idea? Uh, we, we have some sort of a way to compute the Greek K uh, functions in the exponent, but not the Greek K plus one. And this would be useful for this setting and for other settings. Um, uh, so they suggested this uh, notion of multilinear maps. And well, there's a, 
question of terminology, uh, what do you call multilinear map and what do you call grade encoding schemes? And I was actually ready to admit defeat when I was preparing this slide because uh, the terminology is getting so blurry and everybody just says multilinear maps. But then Rachel's talk yesterday, she did make this distinction, so I am going to keep that, I mean, I'm going to keep that as well, even though for this talk it's not going to matter. Um, there is, there is a minute difference, but, but it's, not, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter for, uh, for this talk. Um, so grade encoding schemes uh, that were defined by uh, Garg Gentry and Halevi um, have the following property. So um, it's, uh, it's a way to encode elements. Um, so in the analogy to the Diffie-Hellman thing, the elements are these uh, A1, A2, A3. And this encoding also has this uh, tag or level or index that essentially says what's the degree of the polynomial that is required to compute this encoding. Um, and the property of, of these encodings is that if you take two encodings in the same level, in the same degree, you can add them together. And if you multiply two, enco and if you multiply two of these encodings, uh, then again, you get an encoding of the product, but under the sum of these levels. And this sort of corresponds to the fact that you know, the product has the degree that is the sum of the degrees of the, um, of the operands. Um, so this is uh, sort of the, the very basic setting. Uh, there are additional very useful variants. Uh, you can think about these, uh, these levels instead of uh, just as uh, scalars, you can think about them as vectors and then you get richer functionality. But for this talk, just think about this very basic, uh, just this very basic setting. And um, you should be able to do it up to level, uh, up to level K, um, and, uh, uh, but not, be, not beyond, not beyond this, uh, not beyond this uh, point. That's the sort of ideal uh, functionality that, that you'd want. Um, but what uh, we know how to construct, or what we hope that we know how to construct, or what we hope that we hopefully know to construct, uh, is this um, relaxed notion of graded encoding scheme, or approximate uh, graded encoding schemes, where um, the encoding is not uh, deterministic, just like taking a generator and raising it to a power, but rather it is randomized. So there are many possible encodings for every value. And uh, this means that uh, um, an essential property that we had before, that we can easily tell if an encoding uh, is, it actually encodes a zero value just by checking if it's the unit of the group that we're talking about, now disappears. So we need to fix it by adding an additional zero testing procedure. So even though there are many possible encodings, there is a procedure that tells you whether uh, a given encoding encodes uh, the, value, uh, the value zero or not. Um, another relaxation uh, that is made is that, uh, unlike before, where we could just think of uh, an asymptotic sequence of groups where, uh, our, our, where which have the properties that we want, here we actually need to generate the setting, the, the parameters that allow us to do these, uh, uh, to operate on these encodings using some sort of secret information. So there's a secret setup phase where you generate all these parameters and then sort of you can publish uh, the, the, the parameters that allow you to perform the operations on these, um, on these encodings. Uh, and lastly, uh, and annoyingly, uh, this was something that we didn't think that, that was needed in the beginning, uh, actually just encoding elements requires also secret information. So the first schemes that were published uh, suggested a way to do public encodings, but this turned out to be, um, to cause insecurity, um, and, uh, and uh, the candidates that we know right now are not secure if you, if you uh, want to allow public encoding. So encoding also needs to be done, um, also needs to be done secretly. Um, and we, we know of many different variants of graded encoding schemes, but it can all be grouped up to three families. Um, one is uh, uh, stemmed from the first construction, uh, first proposal by uh, Garg, Gentry, and Halevi. Um, and these use ID lattices. And this talk is mostly going to be focused on, on this family of candidates. Um, Cohen, Le Point, Tibushi suggested um, an analogous scheme over the integers instead of over lattices. The structure is fairly analogous in, in many ways. Uh, and Gorbanov, uh, Gentry, Gorbanov, and Halevi uh, suggested a scheme that has slightly more restricted functionality. It provides graph multilinear functionality, um, and it, it works over matrices. Uh, and uh, again, even though it's fairly different, still there's many common uh, ideas that underlie all of these schemes, and many of the techniques that, uh, that work on one can also be carried over to the others. Um, in particular, sort of there's a common high-level approach to constructing graded encoding schemes, and that is to start with a homomorphic encryption scheme, a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. 
Um, and that gives you a very similar functionality to what you want, right? You can encode elements just by encrypting them. And you can perform really any computation that you want, right? You can uh, add, multiply, uh, do whatever you want. Uh, but of course, you cannot do a zero test because uh, you, the, the output of the homomorphic operations is still going to be encrypted. So the way you handle that is by sort of coming up with a degenerate version of the secret key and putting that, publishing that, and trying to come up with a way to use this degenerate secret key in order to test whether a given encryption encrypts zero or not. And in order to enforce the, um, the degree restriction, you want this degenerate secret key to only allow you to test whether something is zero if it was computed by a degree k polynomial at most. And encodings that were produced by higher degree polynomials, well, the zero testing should not work somehow. And indeed, many of the attacks sort of take advantage of, of trying to come up with uh, uh, encodings that were not computed as prescribed and applying the zero testing to them and getting useful things, as it turns out. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what's known. And in this talk, I'm going to discuss uh, ideas that turned out to be insecure, as I said. Um, it does not necessarily mean that they're bad ideas. Um, and I'm, I'm going to focus on ones that uh, perhaps you didn't get, get a chance to see uh, because, because the, the, the attacks came very shortly after the, the schemes were introduced, in particular, one by Gentry, Halevi, and Lepois, and um, a scheme by, by Gentry and Halevi um, later this year. Um, so both of these are presented as variants of the GGH13 scheme uh, based, on, uh, based on ideal lattices. But these idea, uh, but the ideas are applicable, uh, applicable elsewhere, so you can definitely construct uh, a broken scheme over the integers if you want, uh, based on similar ideas. Um, good. So I'm going to start with some background on the GGH13 scheme. I'm actually happy that uh, Mark covered some of it in, in the previous talk. Uh, this talk in general is, is pretty technical. Um, so if you were planning to zone out whenever you see an equation, please don't. You're going to miss the entire talk. Uh, I'll try to perhaps talk fast, but not go so fast. Um, and you can stop me if you want. So what's the setting uh, of, this, of this scheme? So everything we do, all the arithmetic that we're going to do, is going to be over these polynomial cyclotomic rings. OK, perhaps a scary name. But what we're thinking about <coughs> is really um, a bunch of polynomials with integer coefficients that are taken modulo uh, a different polynomial, this phi m of x. But we can just think about the uh, sort of, by now canonical example, just think about the polynomial x to the power n plus 1. n is the power of 2, but it's not going to matter for, for this talk. So we're just thinking about uh, polynomials of degree at most n minus 1 with integer coefficients. And uh, this is a ring in the sense that I can, well, I can add two of these polynomials, and they're going to stay polynomials of degree at most n minus 1. And I can also multiply these polynomials. When I multiply, I obviously get a polynomial of a higher degree, but then I take this new polynomial modulo this x to the n plus 1. What does it mean to take it modulo x to the n plus 1? So it means that the, the uh, value x to the n is actually equivalent to minus 1. x to the n plus 1 is equivalent to 0. So if I have a polynomial and I multiply it by x, for example, what does this mean? It means that all the coefficients sort of take a step to the right. Uh, like the, the, free, uh, the free coefficient becomes, uh, becomes the coefficient of x, the coefficient of x becomes the coefficient of x squared, and so on. And the last one, the coefficient that was the coefficient of x to the n minus 1, well, becomes the coefficient of x to the n, but x to the n is equivalent to minus 1, so it goes all the way back to the end of the line and takes a minus sign and becomes the free coefficient. So this is, this, uh, this is how we do uh, arithmetics. And uh, we also have a large modulus q, so it's going to be sub-exponential in n, Pretty big. Um, and we're going to also think about taking this polynomial ring and taking that modulo q. So uh, in, these, uh, in these cyclotomics, what it means is that uh, you just take all the coefficients modulo q. So, this, so we're, we're going to think about both r and r sub q. So r is just, you know, d just doing things over the integers, uh, modulo x to the n plus 1. And uh, r sub q is taking all the, um, all the coefficients modulo q. And uh, you can still do addition, multiplication, whatever you want. All right, so this is, this is the setting. Now, how do we generate the parameters for the scheme? So um, there's going to be this uh, uh, value z, which is just random in RQ. So it's a polynomial of degree n minus 1, um, where all the coefficients are just random modulo q. So this is one secret parameter. The other secret parameter is a small polynomial g. 
Um, and because it's, uh, so what does it mean that it's small? Well, for our purposes, just think about all the coefficients of G as being, uh, as being small integers. And I'm thinking about it as an element in R, even though I could have also thought about it as an element in RQ. But I, whenever, whenever we're thinking about G, I do want you to think about it not as a modular uh, uh, element, but rather as an element in the, in the original polynomial ring. Um, so these are the, the secret parameters. And the plaintext space, the thing that is sort of analogous to ZP that we had in the Diffie-Hellman example, is going to be um, the set of cosets uh, in R relative to G. What do I mean by that? I can always you know, take a polynomial in R and take it mod modulo G, and I'm going to get some, some other polynomial. So uh, the set of all possible uh, results of this uh, modular uh, 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 operation is going to be my, my plaintext space. So just, uh, so, you know, in, in uh, sort of algebraic lingo, I can think about this uh, ideal G times R, and my plaintext space is just a set of cosets of this, uh, of this, of this ideal. And um, I guess not surprisingly, because you already saw Mark's talk, uh, it turns out that um, you don't want to reveal the, this, this plaintext space. It turns out that uh, um, if, the, if the adversary knows G times R, it's going to be pretty bad. Uh, so this is why I'm listing this under the secret parameters. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, about this uh, in, in a minute. So how do we encode? Um, so an encoding is going to look something like this. I'm going to, uh, if I want to encode an element, so an element is just, you know, a coset uh, of, of G times R. So a coset is just like a, you know, a huge set of elements. So I'm just going to pick one of these elements, in particular one that is small. So I'm picking a small element in the coset, uh, call it alpha, and dividing it, divided by Z um, over, over, this, uh, over this RQ. So, um, uh, so encoding just looks like alpha times Z, and it encodes the element, which is the coset that alpha belongs to. This is, uh, this is how the encoding works, and I'm not going to tell you how to pick alpha. This is also some uh, uh, technical difficulty that goes in there if you want to sort of not reveal too much information. Um, in particular, zero encodings are going, to be, uh, are going to matter for us. So what is a zero encoding? So in a zero encoding, the element alpha is a short element that actually belongs to the ide ideal G times R which means that you can think about it as a multiple of, uh, the, secret, uh, of the secret polynomial G. So you can think about this, uh, uh, you can think about a zero encoding as alpha over Z, where alpha is by itself <coughs> R times G for a small r. Um, it's not immediate why this R should be small, it actually requires uh, picking G in a particular way, but let's not worry about it. I'm telling you that this is what zero encodings look like. Um, okay, so this is how the encoding works. Uh, how do we do operations? Well, you know, we get, we have these uh, encodings, which are just elements in RQ. I can just add and multiply them if I want to add and multiply things. So I can add things, uh, and these alphas are going to add, and I can multiply, and the alpha is going to, uh, the alphas are going to multiply, and indeed I'm going to get, when I multiply two of these alphas, I am going to get something that is in the coset that corresponds to the product of the co cosets of the, uh, of the inputs. But when I multiply this uh, degree of this z in the denominator, that's actually going to grow and it's going to be the sum of the degrees of the elements that I multiplied. So the degree of the z in the denominator really sort of tells me which level, which level I'm in. And now when I want to do a zero test, um, I'm going to sort of, I need to cancel out this z to the power k, right? I want to zero test elements in, in level k. So elements of, of that were results of uh, computations of degree k. So I'm going to cancel out, uh, I want to cancel out the z to the k, and then sort of test if what I got was uh, indeed in the ideal g times r. So uh, um, the, way, the way GGH proposed to do that is by publishing this zero testing uh, parameter, which again is, think about as a degenerate secret key, um, and it indeed has this uh, element which is z to the k divided by g times um, another element h which is not too big, but not too small. Um, and uh, this, uh, and, and the way that you perform the zero test is just by multiplying your input encoding v with this pzt and taking the result mod modulo q and seeing if you and checking if you got something that is small. So, like Mark uh, uh, showed in the previous talk, when you do start with encoding of zero, then you know z to the k over g is going to cancel out, and uh, 
um, what you're going to get in the end is just this h times the r from the encoding, and that's going to be pretty small. It's still going to be small, much smaller than q. Um, but if you take something that is not a zero encoding, uh, you're going to have this uh, additional term that comes from, from, the, from being a non-zero coset, and uh, things are, are, not going to be, are not going to be small anymore. So uh, this is how zero test works. And the source of problems uh, is uh, this zeroizing, uh, zeroizing, I don't know, approach. Um, so um, just, uh, just for the purpose of this, uh, I'm going to denote by um, alpha in parentheses some encoding with numerator alpha. I'm not going to care exactly what's, what, are the, what are the levels and what's the degree. But, uh, so what happens if I try to do a zero test of uh, an encoding of zero times some other encoding? Then this is the same as applying the zero test procedure to this product of r times g times this alpha. And r times g times alpha is a zero encoding because it does, uh, it does reside in the, um, in the ideal g times r. It is a multiple of g. And therefore, after the zero testing, what I'm getting is exactly h times r times this alpha. And um, if alpha is by itself also a zero encoding, it's also in the, in the ideal uh, of, of g, then, and we, and we do it sufficiently many times, then we can actually recover the plaintext space. We can recover some uh, representation of uh, this ideal uh, g times r. And at least at a very high level, this allows you to sort of do arithmetics after the zero test. So you take these things that are uh, after the zero test, and you can also uh, sort of try, uh, try to uh, multiply things and see what happens. You can try to see if the product of two, of two things is the same as the product of two other things. So um, this, uh, this allows you to learn things that uh, you're not supposed to learn. So this is, this is bad. Um, uh, so this is the problem. And uh, what we're going to try to do next is figure out if we can get around it. All right, oh, and I should say, yeah, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't even say why recovering g times r is bad. I just gave a very high level intuition. But I should also say that there is, in particular, um, a quantum attack given uh, if, if I actually know g times r, uh, it allows me to recover g, which really seems bad. Um, so so if, you allow, if you allow to use quantum techniques, then it's like, then this attack is devastating. Otherwise, it just see, it just, it's just bad. Um, so. All right, um, good. So how do, we, how, do we try to, how do we try to fix this? Um, so what, what Mark told you in the previous talk is that maybe we can try to sort of avoid the problem. We are going to carefully design our application so that uh, our encodings are not going, going to allow uh, an adversary to you know, come up with, with a, repre a representation of g times r. It's not going to be able to you know, come up with multiples of g after the, after the zero testing. Um, but this was sort of a last resort because that's really what you would, not what you'd want to do. We want these zero encodings. Uh, again, Mark talked about it. We, we want to be able to re-randomize. We want to be able to uh, do public encodings. So it would have been better if we had these, uh, if, we, if we were able to uh, get over it and not get around it. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, sort of the motivation to the, of, of th this was the motivation of many, many attempts. So the first ones were to try to sort of redesign the encodings or the zero testing parameter to not expose this, to not expose this uh, uh, g times r. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about some of these attempts today, but uh, ones that I'm not going to talk about uh, are, for example, to try to encode the zero um, not just as a, as a a particular zero element, but I'm going to encode the zero as a matrix that has a zero, uh, a zero eigenvalue. So a matrix with a zero eigenvalue does not necessarily have any zero elements. So perhaps this is, going to, this is going to help you because you're not going to be able to have a zero element that you can take all the way to the zero testing parameter and get, and get, something, and get something bad. Uh, but this turns out to be, um, uh, to, to, not, to not provide the, uh, uh, a secure solution because, again, because you can do this uh, post zero testing arithmetic. So you get a bunch of these things that are not zero by themselves, and then you play around with them, and you again, and you get you get a matrix that is that has a zero eigenvalue, uh, but it has zero eigenvalue post uh, post zero testing. And when you actually compute the determinant, for example, of this matrix, then you get a real you know multiple of multiple of g. You'll get a multiple of g. It's a, it's a, it has 
a zero eigenvalue modulo g times r. Modulo g times r, yeah, I didn't say that. Um, and, uh, um, you know, similar problems come up also in the over the integers and the over the integer schemes and uh, um, proposed solutions to, to the to similar zeroizing problems. And uh, again, similar attacks uh, had been, had been presented. So um, this, the, the specific uh, fix that I am going to talk about now uh, is tries to target, you know, tries to find a source for all of these, uh, uh, for all of these, for all of these attacks, for uh, for find find a common reason why all of these attacks work, um, and they figure out that, that the, the zero testing actually preserves the linear structure, which is a very useful property. What do I mean by that? When I apply the zero test to say a product of elements, so the zero test in the previous thing is just to multiply it by this PZT, and even in these other fixes, what you do is. You, you take the encoding and uh, the encoding is now going to be a matrix and you multiply it by something on the left and by something on the right. But still, when you apply to a product of things, then to like a product say ABC, then what you get is something that depends on A times B times something that depends on C. So I can really sort of make sure that, you know, whatever special property that I had uh, pre zero testing uh, in this B is going to survive also, uh, also after the zero testing. And uh, um, this seems to be a source of many troubles, uh, of many problems that, that we have in this, uh, uh, in this setting. And um, Gentry, Halevi, and Lepois uh, thought maybe we can try to do a nonlinear zero testing. Maybe we can try to sort of shatter this nice structure that we have for the zero test. We just sort of multiply by nice things over these, over these rings. You preserve the ring structure and everything. So let's try to do something that's, that's different, something that preserves the structure. Um, and they proposed the following thing. So let's think about let's think about the zero test again, the, the GGH 13 zero test. So what do you do? You have this PZT, it's a polynomial, it's a it's an element in this uh, in this ring module Q, and you have your encoding, which is again an element in this uh, RQ in the ring module Q. And you multiply them, and you check if what you got is was was small. But what does it mean to multiply two polynomials in this ring RQ? So you take two let's say vectors over ZQ, the coefficients of these two polynomials, and you get a new vector. But this new vector is, uh, um, is, is, just, is just, I guess, bilinearly dependent on these, on these two input vectors. In particular, if we only care about uh, uh, the, the input, if we, th if, if we think about this input V represented as a vector, then uh, the output of the zero test, this new polynomial, is just going to be a bunch of linear functions of the coefficients of these vectors. Right, if I, I take, I'm taking a polynomial and I'm multiplying it by another, by another fixed and known polynomial, this is equivalent to defining a set of linear functions and just computing these, uh, just computing these inner products. So really, um, we can think about the zero testing of uh, GGH13 as, uh, a as a public matrix L, and the zero testing is just thinking about our polynomial as a vector, doing a matrix vector multiplication module Q, and checking if all of the elements in the vector that we got were small or not. So this is just a different way of presenting, a more general way of presenting the zero testing of, uh, the zero testing of GGH13. And now they say, okay, so if we have a bunch of these uh, linear functions where we know that all these linear functions actually uh, give you something small for every V that is zero, then um, if, if, if V encodes zero, then, then these, these things come up to something small then maybe we can try to sort of tensor them together and get some higher degree function which still has this zero testing property. So what they're saying, so we have a bunch of these uh, LIs, a bunch of linear functions that, that do zero test. Just take all of the, all of the cross products of these LIs and uh, sum them together with some small coefficients. So you can think about this as, uh, so each of these things, you can, you can think about these either as uh, Polynomial, uh, uh, you can think about it, sorry, the right way to think about it, I guess, is, is a tensoring uh, of these, uh, of these uh, linear functions. And you can think about this, uh, this new thing that you get as a sum of, uh, um, I guess, degree one tensors. And at least, uh, sort of, hopefully, uh, it should be hard if you have, if you get, uh, if you get uh, um, a tensor of many, um, um, uh, sorry, a sum of many, uh, degree one tensors, it should be uh, hard to decompose and get back these, uh, uh, these degree one things. And perhaps this new zero test is going to hide 
um, uh, these linear functions that are supposedly bad. So the hope was that if I only give you this new zero test in the form of just giving you all the coefficients of this new quadratic function of, uh, uh, new quadratic function of V, then this would hide the structure behind the linear zero test. So again, I'm thinking about the GGH13 zero test just as a bunch of linear equations modulo Q. I'm going to take um, um, a sum of products of these functions. This gives me a quadratic function. This new quadratic function, whenever I evaluate it over uh, er an, an encoding of zero, is still going to give me something small. It's going to be square of what I got before because this guy's gonna be small, this guy's going to be small. Multiply them together, not that small, but still pretty small. Add a bunch of these together, not that small, but still pretty small. Um, and we can still do the, we, we're, still, we're still getting the functionality that we need. And perhaps, perhaps it, also, it also gives us security um, because we're really sort of messing up the structure. There's no ring anymore, there's no polynomials. You just, you take this element which, uh, which we thought about before as a ring element and you just think about it as a sequence of, uh, a sequence of numbers module Q and you apply some quadratic function to them. There's no reason to think that there's going to be any structure that survives this, uh, any useful structure that survives this operation. So uh, this, was, uh, this was the proposal. Um, and uh, they also pointed out that sometimes uh, degree two, uh, things in degree two are still easy, but when you go to a higher degree, uh, things become, become hard. Uh, so you can actually do it for more than degree two. You can take uh, you know, products of, of three of these linear functions or, or more than that, but not more than a constant because you still need to be able to uh, it, this is going to give you a zero test whose description is, or whose description is of size n to the power d. Um, so you don't want to take too high of a degree, except that there's going to be a blow up of the, uh, of the smallness and also there's going to be a blow up of the size of the description. All right, so um, turns out that, the, um, the <laughs> that it doesn't hide as much as, as, much as, you'd, ho as, much as you'd hope. Um, and this is uh, um, something that we figured out with uh, Gentry, Halevi, Lepois, Sahai, and uh, Tibushi. Um, so let's see, let's see how do we how to extract um, useful useful information out of this uh, out of this zero testing. So you know you cl they claim that uh, quadratic zero testing is good. Then let me show you that this quadratic thing is no better than a linear zero testing. So this quadratic zero testing we know that it's. It, it was constructed as the sum over ij of these gamma ij, li, lj, that's fine. And I can also just write this um, um, quadratic polynomial. So it's uh, delta ij times vi vj, or in mat matrix form, v transpose delta v. Uh, this is the form that's gonna be convenient for me. And let's just say that delta is upper triangular because vi vj and vj vi are the same thing. So I can just think about the upper triangular representation of this matrix. Um, and the idea is to say, well, you know, these, uh, you have Li of V times Lj of V, but maybe I can try to think about it as sort of a bilinear form. Maybe I can apply all the left-hand guys on some V and all the right-hand guys on a different, on a fixed, on some fixed uh, zero U, and then get a, and then make it linear again, because uh, the, the one of these guys is going to become linear, and uh, one of these guys is going to become constant, sorry, if I evaluate it on a fixed value, and then I'm just going to get a linear function. So what if I defined my new zero, te zero test double prime? Um, now it takes two values, a fixed, this u, which you th should think about as a fixed, uh, fixed zero, fixed representation, fixed encoding of zero, not value zero, um, and uh, v, which is, the actual, which is the actual input. And instead of computing v transpose delta v, I'm going to compute u transpose delta v. I can certainly do that and um, my, uh, in my naivety, I'm hoping that perhaps if I do that, then I'm actually getting uh, sum over uh, Li of u times Lj of v. So if this was true, then I would be in good shape because this new function is actually a linear function in, in v. And if this is a zero test, then I'm getting a linear zero test instead of a quadratic zero test. Um, so my, my, new, my new linear zero test would just be uh, u transpose times delta. But of course, it's not true. Uh, it, it's, very, it's very easy to see. This delta is sort of an upper triangular matrix. So if, if I'm thinking about this uh, uh, right hand, the, the wishful um, result that I want to get, it has terms uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the kind ui times vj, and it also has uj times vi. But, um, but if, I'm, if I'm thinking about, but if I'm thinking about uh, 
doing this bilinear form with an upper triangular matrix, then I'm only going to get either vi times uj if i is smaller than j, or uh, the other one. But I'm, I'm, I, can, I cannot get both. So this guy actually has both ui vj and uj vi, and uh, um, this one doesn't, so obviously they are not the same. Uh, so this seems to be a big deal. I mean, the first time you think about it, you're like, well, of course, you know, the way the it's a, it's a quadratic function of a single, um, um, uh, a single uh, input vector. So of course you cannot you know, just make up a new uh, set of inputs and make it make sense. Uh, but it really, it really isn't. Uh, it's, it's actually very easy to sort of make this thing symmetric. Um, and you can just think about, instead of just taking u transpose delta v, you can just also take the opposite, uh, um, the opposite function. So v transpose <coughs> times delta times u. And then sort of all these elements that we're missing here are actually going to appear twice here and vice versa. So actually, if you take the sum of these things, you get, you, you actually get, uh, you know, the original thing that you wanted, but also the, uh, the, the converse of it. So, um, um, so, so this, this will actually allow you to get something very similar to what you wanted. And in particular, if I'm fixing uh, um, a zero encoding u, then I am going to get a linear function. I'm going to get a linear function here, which is just u transpose times delta plus delta transpose. So uh, this, will allow, this will allow you to, to actually start with a quadratic zero test and bring it down to a linear zero test. Um, so this is, uh, already shows that uh, this idea is, is problematic, um, that just going, going up to quadratic does not seem, does not seem to be very helpful. Um, and actually, it can also be it can also be generalized. So, in in the previous uh, in the previous in, in what I in what I in what I just showed, I did use seem to I did seem to use the fact that uh, this uh, this quadratic zero test was actually generated as a sum of multiples of linear zero tests. But maybe there is some you know magical way to generate a quadratic zero test that does not come from linear zero tests. You cannot just write it as a sum of of uh, um, uh, rank one matrices that are also zero, that are also good zero tests. Um, so can you, can you sort of say something about uh, general uh, quadratic, quadratic zero tests? And turns out you can. Um, so you can take any quadratic zero test and sort of think about, uh, um, oh, okay, so, sorry. You take an arbitrary zero test, which is a multivariate, uh, which is represented as a multi multivariate polynomial of low degree. Doesn't matter how you got it. Um, and you can just compute the directional derivative of this, uh, um, of this polynomial in the direction of a fixed zero encoding. What do I mean by that? This is sort of a fancy way of saying that I'm, I'm starting with some zero test and I'm thinking about zero test, uh, I'm thinking about a new function, zero test prime in the direction of u just as being zero test of v plus u minus zero test of v. So this will, uh, uh, on one hand, drop the degree by one. And on the other hand, this new guy is still going to be a valid zero test just because of the sort of linearity of zeroness, right? Because if v is a, if v is a zero and I'm adding it to u, then v plus u is also a zero. So just by the functionality of the zero test, this guy needs to be small. But uh, and, and in addition, zero test of v also needs to be small. So the difference is also going to be the difference is also going to be very small, and indeed uh, this uh, um, um, derivative of the zero test is going to is going to give you something small, and it's going to have a degree uh, a less a smaller degree than the one that you started with. You need to make sure that you don't actually get like something like zero or a constant here, um, but uh, this should be okay at least heuristically. Uh, if it happens, then it means that uh, uh, you have some other weakness in your in your scheme. Um, so this is, uh, this is sort of a more general way, uh, more general way of doing it. Again, the smallness reduces with every, you know, the, the higher de the degree that you have, um, the, the more slackness you need in your, um, the more slackness you need in your, uh, separation between something that's small and something that's not small in order for this thing to work. Uh, but, but it seems like you should not, you, you cannot go beyond constant degree. Uh, unless you're thinking about somehow very sparse zero tests or, or stuff like that. I don't, I don't know that this was, that this was considered, but it just seemed like perhaps the idea of going to a higher degree is, is problematic. You don't actually want to bank on, you know, this very, very fine-grained distinction between what is small and what is not small. Um, but 
I don't know, perhaps you can think about something that's like super high degree and then, and then, and then things do work out. Right, then, then again, you, you're gonna have problems with smallness. That's true. Um, perhaps thing can, things cancel out somehow. I, I don't know, it doesn't seem to work, but uh, I, I don't know that it had been tried uh, uh, after, this, uh, after this attack was, was discovered. Okay, so um, actually this, if, uh, if you're just thinking about it like this, it doesn't seem to be connected to what we saw before, but if you try to just compute what this derivative is for, um, for degree two, you see that you actually get what, what we got before. So it is sort of a, it, it is a gen generalization. Um, another question that you could ask yourself, another question you could ask yourself um, is, uh, uh, so, so we said that quadratic zero testing is, is uh, not, not better, does not hide more than a linear zero test, but perhaps a linear zero test is still, uh, um, is still going to protect you somehow because the, um, the zero test from the GGH13 is not just linear, it's a collection of linear functions that are, that are somehow related. You multiply two ring elements. Whereas here, you can just think about giving one inner product of the coefficients of the, uh, of the, coefficients of the polynomial that you're, that you're uh, using as your, as your encoding. So perhaps this is better than doing, uh, this is better than giving, just giving you a zero test. Um, so we want to reconstruct this uh, PZT from any linear uh, zero test, uh, from any linear zero test function. So I'm go just going to start with a function uh, that is an inner product with the coefficients of the polynomial and also has the functionality of zero test. And I want to come up with a ring element that has the property that when, I, when I'm doing the product over the, over the ring ZQ, I'm getting small things, uh, I'm getting small things for zero and not small things for non-zeros. And it turns out this can be done at least for some or many, uh, many polynomial rings. So we're going to start with some um, non-zero vector delta such that for any zero encoding V, the inner product of delta and V um, modulo Q is going to be small. So I'm, I'm thinking about V as uh, the ring element and vector V as the vector of coefficients of this, uh, of this encoding. Um, so the way we're going, to, we're going to sort of reconstruct this, uh, uh, the way that we're going to reconstruct uh, um, the, the PZT, the ring element that has the property, is by uh, noticing that this polynomial multiplication, so we want a PZT such that if I take PZT times V, I'm getting essentially the inner product of delta times V. So let's start by trying to find a PZT such that when I multiply it by P, I get this inner product at least in one coordinate. At least one coordinate is really going to be this inner product. So, um, so it's easy to see that, and let's say that's going to be the coefficient of x to the n minus one. So just because um, uh, polynomial multiplication is a, bilinear, uh, is a bilinear operation, there exists a matrix such that the coefficient, each coefficient actually, but I mean each coefficient has a matrix, but the coefficient of x to the n minus one in uh, taking a times b over the ring is just going to be the vector a transpose times m times b vector. Now this, this matrix just, just exists. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new vector starting from this delta uh, that I had as my zero test. I'm going to define mu to be delta times m minus one. And I'm just going to think about mu of x, uh, mu of x just as an element which, uh, just as the ring element that corresponds to, the vector, to this vector of coefficients. Now what happens when I'm... I know, I know. Uh, so this is one of these, this is why I said for some, uh, so one of these things is that you need to make sure that M is invertible. Um, that's why I'm, I didn't verify that it works for all, for all rings. Actually in the write-up, we only have it for X to the N plus one. For X to the N plus one, it's, it's, uh, it's actually just, uh, um, yeah, but it, that's, that's definitely true. So it's definitely true that you need to verify that this uh, M inverse does exist. Um, okay, but if, it, but if it does, then uh, what you get is that um, for every, uh, what, what you get, what I claim that you get is that for any zero encoding V, indeed this uh, mu uh, functions as a PZT element. So the, the product over the, over the ring uh, of uh, mu times X times v, v of X uh, is going to be is going to be small. Why is this true? Well, the first uh, um, uh, observation is that well, the way we constructed mu guarantees that the coefficient of x to the n minus one in this product is going to be exactly mu transposed m times v, 
And since I defined mu to be uh, delta transpose times m inverse, this is going to be exactly the inner product of delta and v. So I did sort of organize things so that at least one of these coefficients of this product is going to be, is going to be small. Okay, but you know, what, what, what can we say about the other ones? So what can we say, for example, about the coefficient of x to the n minus two? Well, the coefficient of x to the n minus two in, in mu times v is actually close to the coefficient of x to the n minus one in mu times v times x. Why? Because if I take, if I take, mu, I take mu times v and multiply it by x, then again, the, the coefficient of x to the n minus two takes a step to the right and becomes the coefficient of x to the n minus one. But we might have some spillover from this, uh, um, you know, from this uh, highest uh, coefficient that's going to possibly spill back. So in the case of x to the n minus one, this is actually not going, x to the n plus one, this is actually not going to hurt us at all because it just sort of rotates all the way back and it doesn't hurt the x to the n minus two coefficient, but it could hurt it a little. But still it's going to be close. The coefficient of x to the n minus two here is close to the coefficient of x to the n minus one in this product. However, v, v times x by itself is also an encoding of zero. Because if we started from an encoding of zero and we multiplied it by something, you still, you're still going to get a zero encoding. And therefore, the coefficient of x to the n minus one in this product is supposed to be small just from this, uh, the first property that we wrote. It's going to be really the inner product of delta with the coefficient vector of vx, et cetera, et cetera. You, can, uh, you should hopefully be able to prove by induction that all of these, uh, uh, that all of these coefficients uh, are actually going to be small. And uh, you need to be careful with this, uh, with this spillover, but uh, for many rings, this, uh, this, seems to give you, this seems to give you a PZT element. Um, and it's not clear if you want to, you know, you, you could maybe come up with a ring where this, uh, where this thing doesn't work, but perhaps you don't want to rely on the, you know, on the fact that we couldn't come up with a way to reconstruct the PZT uh, for the security of your, of your construction. Uh, unless you can come up with the, a compelling reason why something like that should actually not work in this, uh, in this, uh, in this new ring that you come up with. Uh, so this uh, summarizes the attack on GHL, and I'm out of time, so I think I'm, uh, I'm going to skip this, uh, this other scheme. I, I suspect that this could happen, um, perhaps another time. Uh, I'll just uh, jump to the conclusion, which is sort of, uh, I don't know, constructing and creating coding schemes seems to be tricky. We haven't figured out the art of, of how to do it yet, as far as I know. Um, many things that we think that should work, like for example, getting a scheme with public encoding, and we just can't figure out a way to make it work. Uh, there's no, doesn't seem to be a, a reason. There, there's no like big barrier that should stop us from doing it, but uh, it just doesn't work out either. Um, and uh, the, the techniques that we use in order to get the functionality, like polynomial, polynomial rings, for example, are double-edged sword. Um, we, we, we actually can use this uh, the symmetry that we use for, for functionality also in order to, in order to launch attacks. Uh, sort of an obvious thing to say, but uh, seems to apply uh, very strongly here. Um, and I guess the last lesson is that we can still be surprised by very simple attacks. So you, you could definitely you know, spend a lot of time uh, thinking about a scheme and thinking about how to attack and be like, oh, the attack from this paper doesn't work, the attack from this paper doesn't work. We're all, seems to, that we covered everything and then it, you, know, you just like add something little to it and then it becomes, uh, you know, then it becomes com completely, uh, completely collapses. So just be careful, I don't know, thank you. <laughs>